Thanks so much for having me. I, uh, I want to do something which is uh, a little bit difficult to do, and that is to try to walk you all through what has been effectively a decade's worth of research that really started me on the journey at working in this joint venture with CAA called Creative Labs. And we started this whole research in partnership with Forbes magazine close to a decade ago, and it was really focused on one subject matter, which was it felt like for a very long time that there was something very different in the air, that the, the notion of innovation and change, while it was very clear, had been a part of our lives for 20, 30 years, something was very unique about what we were going through. And it was that that sort of focused on this path to answer a very different and, and specific question, which was, is this any different? It is what we are living through in the last decade any different than what we have gone through before as a stage of technological advancement, innovation, and retail? And it, it, it turns out that it is quite different. And in fact, you can pinpoint that difference to a moment in time. And when you think about that moment in time, it goes back to 2007 when we see the rise of the iPhone and we see the rise of the beginning of a 12 month decline into one of the worst recessions effectively in, in the history of our world and certainly modernity. And we put ourselves in these positions where we are consistently rewriting the planet on a regular basis. And the best way to think about that is as a reset of the operating system of our world. And anything short of that, to think of it as a reset of the operating system would be to really not grasp the massive societal and behavioral changes that are going on around us at such large scale. Because if you think about it in just the context of innovation, innovation is typically restricted to things like business models and technological advance, which miss some of the larger social human behavioral causation that's going on around us. We view it as a giant reset of our OS that happens on a consistent basis. Now, the one thing I, I do want to do is uh, give you a little bit of my own bias before I start getting into this and tell you a bit more about what I do. And as Pierce mentioned, I run a joint venture that was set up with Creative Artists Agency three years ago, in effect, to start to build new ventures at scale for celebrities in, in the direct download market and direct to consumer market. And this is an example of one of the products we've recently launched, which we're super proud of, which is Carrie Underwood's Fit52, a workout product that's done incredibly well for us uh, during this difficult time. But I would say, when you think about this concept of, of rewriting and rewriting the planet, it's not really just a theory that we worked on and it's not just a set of research. It's effectively what I do every day in partnership with CAA, which is take a look at an industry that's been around for a very long time and traditionally has sold and operated in particular ways, often with intermediaries in between its channels. And now we have this incredible opportunity to build and sell direct. And that, the concept of the rewrite, while it was very much a part of our general research. It's not really just theory as terms of what I do. It's literally what I do every day. Uh, another part of my life which colors my view on this is I'm one of the two owners of a professional soccer team in England called Coventry City. This was a big year for us as we were promoted. But it also colors my view on how I see talent and using individual direct talent in the world of speaking to consumers. So what I want to try to do in the half an hour or so we have together is really three things. I want to, one, walk you through this rewrite and give you a bit of a framework so that we can all look at these changes from a researched framework that it goes back over a decade, but really looks back over the last three centuries. Secondly, I want to talk to you a little bit about celebrities and direct-to-consumer and this evolution of the model of how we use personality and talent to build meaningful product. And lastly, I want to get into a bit of the how, which are the strategy and tactics about how we do this and how this looks different than it did even two years ago. So when you're looking at these rewrites, it's very difficult to say in, in any concrete way that you are living through a rewrite or a reset of the planet. And although it's a bit oversimplified, generally what we're looking for is roughly speaking a 35% shift in consumer and communications behavior spread out over the course of most of the global population. 
And it's not an exact science, but when you start to see this shift of 30 to 35% in the way we consume and the way we communicate, you can very much guess that we are entering into one of these resetting cycles, exactly as we are today during COVID. Now, this is not the first time this has happened. In fact, we are in a very clear stage of this occurring. And if you go back to 1750 and count backwards, you will see that the world is fundamentally the same. It almost didn't change for 6,000 years. If you look at all of the things that we would hold uh, as measurements of growth and value in a civilization, things like life expectancy, uh, people living in poverty, the percentage of people living in democratic institutions, all of that was fundamentally stagnated for almost 6,000 years until you hit the Industrial Revolution. And in around 1750, we began a process over the last 300 years, three, three centuries, where we are consistently entering a cycle where we are resetting the operating system of our planet. It happens quite frequently and quite regularly. And generally the, these resets, this pattern that we've now entered into, this three century pattern, these resets are generally only caused by four things. They are either caused by financial distress, war, technological shift, or medical. And if you go back to 2007, you would see that there were two fingers on that button of the reset. It was financial and technological. Today, we are clearly living in a medical reset. Now, one of the things that you'll see that's missing from here is social causation. And in fact, what we don't see is social causes causing these resets. They can often divine and set up foundations for the resets, but generally it's these four causes. But, but here's the thing that is interesting. We started this research, like I said, about a decade ago, and it was very much designed for these moments. And if you look at these moments, the thing that I would encourage everyone to remember is that these resets are definable, repetitive, and predictable patterns. You can almost always see the pattern in which these things occur. There are very clear stages. And typically, that it is, it is unusual historically to not see this pattern repeat itself. So while we have the tendency living in this COVID world to think this is unique and unprecedented, and if we, you know, if you only had a buck for any time anyone said the word unprecedented, you'd be wealthy. The truth is that while there are elements of this that are unprecedented, the pattern itself is not. And it is actually quite repetitive and predictable. And the companies that end up surviving, regardless of who they sell to, are the ones that are good at being on the right side of that pattern. And generally, the way the pattern works is once you've got a finger sitting on the reset a button, so whether that is war, technology, finance, medical, when you've got that finger sitting on the reset button, once that finger comes off the causation of that reset, there are generally two stages and very clear stages after. The first is a devaluation period, which looks like a recession or a depression. And generally over the last three centuries, that has lasted between nine and 18 months, generally speaking. Sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little shorter. But it is immediately followed by a growth cycle, anywhere from three to 12 years. And typically over the last 100 years, the growth cycle that we enter into is typically larger and longer than the one that was previous. So the thing to remember in all this, which people often get caught in the weeds, is that this devaluation period, which is almost guaranteed, is always matched by a growth cycle. You cannot point to a moment in history, in modern history, where a devalu devaluation or deflationary market was not immediately followed by growth. And so now you have to start thinking about when that growth cycle occurs and how you sit on the right side of it. And let me give you a bit of insight into how this looked in our last recession, in our last reset. So you can see that the recession lasted between recession and recovery about seven and a half quarters. So slightly longer than the traditional devaluation period, but the recovery period was one of the longest we had ever seen in history. It was almost a decade long. <clears throat> so you can start to see that the pattern continues to reemerge itself. But the question is always around human behavior, and humans are very elastic creatures. We tend to return back to what we know. And so all of this discussion around the new normal and what is the new normal 
we have clear research to indicate in this pattern what is likely going to happen. And generally speaking, in these resets, 90% of the world returns to normal and 10% get forced into a new reality because of the reset itself. And we are now living in this forced, or this very conference is part of this forced reality that we're living in, where our behaviors shift 10%. And we are stuck in this environment where the real question is not what we behave now, because 90% of the world will go back to movie theaters, will go back to restaurants, will go back to sports stadiums, and we can see lots of evidence of this, both in the United States, for good or for bad, and around the world. The real question where the art comes in is how much of that 10% ends up eroding and eating away at the 90% normal during that growth cycle. So how much of that 10% ends up being a, a clear sticking factor that erodes the 90% normal over time? And you can see this happening, for example, in the last reset around software. So prior to 2007, the vast majority of software was sold through enterprise license. But because during that financial correction, it became much more difficult to sell that way and more costly, and it ended up being a better efficient system to deliver it through software as a service. We now today see that 10% forced behavior eroded the whole chain, and now almost no software is sold as an enterprise license. So here we are, I've said we are living in a world that's being rewritten and you are living in this reset moment. I wanna give you an example of some of this 10% change that has affected certainly our industry. And if you think about the live music business or live at all, it has been decimated. But out of that decimation and typically out of these resets comes a very clear truth, which is technology, once we get to the normal again, once that 90% returns back to buildings and live stadiums, it creates a different looking pie than what you had when you started. And generally, historically speaking, technology doesn't reduce the pie, it grows the pie. And we are very much seeing that in live music. And for those of you that are BTS fans, Bang Bang Kong, which was uh, about the first week in June, we saw a real evolution of the way live entertainment will unfold, <clears throat> both now in this reset period and afterwards. And the, con for, uh, the, the concert ended up being in front of just shy of 800,000 people, generating about 20 million in revenue. So to put that in perspective, broadcasting out of Seoul, Korea, the band was able to generate as much revenue in one night as they would have generated in 15, 50,000 seats sold out stadiums in one evening. And this will not be the norm, but it will be accretive, whereas digital was an afterthought before, it's now gonna become a well monetized extension of live. One of these examples of that 10% eroding the 90%. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and end off talking to you about celebrity and direct to consumer and, and what I think is a very different market today than it was uh, even 12 months ago. And I, I want to keep the conversations focused at starting at the strategic and evolving down to tactical. And, and at the biggest strategic level, the most important thing to remember is that Hollywood, the, the entire predication of Hollywood was based on selling product for other people. It was a system of intermediaries and, and middle people that ended up clogging up a channel where generally Hollywood was producing things that ended up assisting other people to sell product, whether it was theater exhibitors or advertisers and consumer goods. The big shift now is as we have moved to see talent have large, really well-defined direct audiences, Hollywood has now shifted strategically to doing what it did before, but also accretively selling its own product and building its own product. And when you think about the market we are in, we are clearly in the noisiest market in history. And in really noisy markets, segmentation wins. Segmentation is really critical when you have a noisy market. And we believe two things. One, that talent is an incredible way to help segment audiences because there's nothing better than when you are looking to market to a demographic to have a face that associates and is part of the community that you are working with and selling to. And, and generally at Creative Labs, what we do is we follow a bit of a bowling pin strategy 
where we will find that lead pin and we will make sure it is super focused, super narrow, find talent that really sits in that community and then broaden to the back pins later when we have a bit more familiarity with the market and the research and the growth. Now, the other important thing here strategically about celebrity-backed D2C product is you have to make real product that is solving real problems. You cannot just go into it with the attitude that you think something is interesting and it's an area that you or talent may be interested in. This has to be real product and the product has to be good because no matter who stands in front of it, if the product is shitty, it's not going anywhere. And so you have to make sure that that lens of working in the same pit and the same uh, arena where you are thinking about quality as any other founder and entrepreneur would think about has got to be what's driving the business itself. And, and as we know, just lastly on the strategic part of it, this has been a massive crossover moment for e-commerce. So while direct-to-consumer is struggling currently in terms of finding its way around financing and figuring out how it fits into an omni-channel universe and how we handle direct-to-consumer with the challenges uh, of physical retail, the numbers are very clear in terms of the growth of e-commerce. This has been a behavioral shifting moment where it took us almost eight years to go from 5% e-commerce penetration in the United States to about 15%. It took us eight and a half weeks to go from 15% to 24%. And we are anticipating a universe where we are close to 50% by 2025. So you are starting to see that one of the um, outputs of this reset has been changes in that 10% behavior pattern around how we buy and getting comfortable with that channel and comfortable with how that channel interacts with the physical world. So this has been a, a monumental moment in terms of the maturation of e-commerce and how people see it and engage with it. Let me shift to the tactical piece for a little bit. The one thing that I think is really important to understand is that you are entering into a celebrity world that is far more sophisticated on its execution in the last 24 months alone. The number of conversations, we've been doing this for about three years, and at the beginning of this, the amount of conversations just in the last 18 to 24 months where talent is incredibly focused on building companies and building brands and the sophistication level of that understanding is so much better than it was. Um, it is an in incredibly uh, different change in that shorter period of time. So this is not the old world where you are thinking purely of endorsements. What we do are not endorsements. In fact, it is in many respects the antithesis of an endorsement because the core difference is the talent and celebrity is founding these companies together with us. They are building these brands. They are often playing the role of product design. And, and in many of these companies, they will go from product design to creative, to working with customers to a, a very important sales function, especially if you sell into traditional retail. Having talent going to buyers meetings is an incredibly valuable thing. And so this is the polar opposite of endorsements. This is about getting in the weeds and really understanding the product and taking the role of that design and co-founder position, which is really what we do. Now, so much so that we prefer to not look at categories that will take away exclusivity in, an, in the endorsement world from one of the clients. So we tend to look at other categories where traditional endorsements don't live, but we see really big markets that have the ability to be segmented and this is an example of something that we, we worked on recently. We are extremely committed and really, really focused on the pet food business. We see a lot of markers in that sector that are really important and valuable. Beauty style markups, not a lot of celebrity crossover. The celebrity crossover that's been in that market has been incredibly successful thus far. And it's a beautiful segmentation audience because today pet food is traditionally sold the same. Okay, sorry, we had some technical difficulties. I'm just gonna go back a slide just in case this got caught in the, in the buffering. What I was saying earlier was that it seems very obvious that celebrity is a great way to market a business and to bring your cost of acquisition down. 
But, but in fact, our cycle looks a little bit different, but it has some of the same elements as every other direct-to-consumer brand. And we generally come out of the gate with a big earned cycle, which drives a lot of customer acquisition and gives us enough data to understand how we move into paid. But generally speaking, we are no different than any other direct-to-consumer business and that we need paid for customer acquisition. But generally, we have these earned bumps that come in and out that a traditional D to C company wouldn't have. But that first earned bump is really important because that's where we establish the narrative and the brand connection with the customer in a way that I think is a superpower compared to other direct to consumer businesses. So I, I want to shift just gears lastly to really how we do this. And when you think about our job, it's really to cast talent into this unique brand halo that they have. And I would say 60 to 70% of what we do is we generate the market. We look at the market, we analyze it, we use data, and we start to work very carefully around pockets of this white space that we think are interesting. And then we often cast talent into those roles. And about 30% of the time, talent delivers ideas to us. So it's a two-way channel, but a good chunk of it is actually casting talent into these roles based on deep research and understanding this brand halo. And the brand halo really starts with the interests and passions of the talent themselves. What do they care about? What are they interested in? And the intersection between their audience's interests, because you have to make sure that there is that deep connection. And in our partnership with CAA, we have incredible analytics that we work on uh, that was built by the CAA Intel Group to look and deconstruct the audience to make sure that the interests of the talent and the interests of the audience are aligned. And, and the last piece of that halo is really about the market opportunity. It is just about focusing on if you don't have a clear reason to sell and you don't have enough of a, a niche market that allows you the beachhead to get in other than trying to shoot with a shotgun. As I mentioned earlier, we take a bowling pin approach where we focus on that first bowling pin, where we look at a very specific demographic that's been, that we can segment out and grow backwards into the back pins. If that opportunity isn't there, it doesn't matter how much the audience is interested or the talent is interested. There has to be clear business realities. So the, the one thing I would say, and I wanna be respectful of, of ending on time, is that the days of merely slapping celebrity onto product, while there's still lots of endorsement, endorsement is a, is a very important model for companies, the days of that being the only alternative are really over. And we have entered into this new era where celebrity brands are starting to get made by understanding specific segmented demographics and making product that brings those demographics together authentically and with purpose. Thank you very much for the time.